Playing with Fire by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle I cannot pretend to say what occurred on the 14th of April last at number 17 Baddeley Gardens. Put down in black and white, my surmise might seem too crude, too grotesque for serious consideration, and yet that something did occur and that it was of a nature which will leave its mark upon every one of us for the rest of our lives, is as certain as the unanimous testimony of five witnesses can make it. I will not enter into any argument or speculation. I will only give a plain statement, which will be submitted to John Moyer, Harvey Deacon and Mrs Delamere, and withheld from publication unless they are prepared to corroborate every detail. I cannot obtain the sanction of Paul Le Duc, for he appears to have left the country. It was John Moyer, the well-known senior partner of Moyer, Moyer and Sanderson, who had originally turned our attention to occult subjects. He had, like very many hard and practical men of business, a mystic side to his nature which had led him to the examination and eventually to the acceptance of those elusive phenomena which are grouped together with much that is foolish and much that is fraudulent, under the common heading of spiritualism. His researches, which had begun with an open mind, ended unhappily in dogma, and he became as positive and fanatical as any other bigot. He represented in our little group the body of men who have turned these singular phenomena into a new religion. Mrs. Delamere, our medium, was his sister, the wife of Delamere, the rising sculptor. Our experience had shown us that to work on these subjects without a medium was as futile as for an astronomer to make observations without a telescope. On the other hand, the introduction of a paid medium was hateful to all of us, was it not obvious that he or she would feel bound to return some result for money received, and that the temptation to fraud would be an overpowering one? No phenomena could be relied upon which were produced at a guinea an hour. But fortunately Moyer had discovered that his sister was mediumistic, in other words, that she was a battery of that animal magnetic force which is the only form of energy which is subtle enough to be acted upon from the spiritual plane as well as from our own material one. Of course, when I say this, I do not mean to beg the question, but I am simply indicating the theories upon which we were ourselves, rightly or wrongly, explaining what we saw. The lady came, not altogether with the approval of her husband, and though she never gave indications of any very great psychic force, we were able at least to obtain those usual phenomena of message tilting which are at the same time so puerile and so inexplicable. Every Sunday evening we met in Harvey Deacon's studio at Baddeley Gardens, the next house to the corner of Merton Park Road. Harvey Deacon's imaginative work in art would prepare anyone to find that he was an ardent lover of everything which was outré and sensational. A certain picturesqueness in the study of the occult had been the quality which had originally attracted him to it. But his attention was speedily arrested by some of those phenomena to which I have referred, and he was coming rapidly to the conclusion that what he had looked upon as an amusing romance and an after-dinner entertainment was really a very formidable reality. He is a man with a remarkably clear and logical brain, a true descendant of his ancestor, the well-known Scotch professor, and he represented in our small circle the critical element, the man who has no prejudices, is prepared to follow facts as far as he can see them, and refuses to theorise in advance of his data. His caution annoyed Moyer, as much as the latter's robust faith amused a deacon, but each, in his own way, was equally keen upon the matter. And I? What am I to say that I represented? I was not the devotee. I was not the scientific critic. 
Perhaps the best that I can claim for myself is that I was the dilettante man about town, anxious to be in the swim of every fresh movement, thankful for any new sensation which would take me out of myself and open up fresh possibilities of existence. I'm not an enthusiast myself, but I like the company of those who are. Moyer's talk, which made me feel as if we had a private pass-key through the door of death, filled me with a vague contentment. The soothing atmosphere of the séance with the darkened lights was delightful to me. In a word, the thing amused me, and so I was there. It was, as I have said, upon the 14th of April last, that the very singular event which I am about to put upon record took place, I was the first of the men to arrive at the studio, but Mrs. Delamere was already there, having had afternoon tea with Mrs. Harvey Deacon. The two ladies and Deacon himself were standing in front of an unfinished picture of his upon the easel. I am not an expert in art, and I have never professed to understand what Harvey Deacon meant by his pictures, but I could see in this instance that it was all very clever and imaginative, fairies and animals and allegorical figures of all sorts. The ladies were loud in their praises, and indeed the colour effect was a remarkable one. "'What do you think of it, Markham?' he asked. "'Well, it's above me,' said I. "'These beasts, what are they? "'Mythical monsters, imaginary creatures, heraldic emblems, "'a sort of weird, bizarre procession of them.' with a white horse in front. "'It's not a horse,' said he rather testily, which was surprising, for he was a very good-humoured fellow as a rule, and hardly ever took himself seriously. "'What is it, then?' "'Can't you see the horn in front? It's a unicorn. I told you they were heraldic beasts. Can't you recognise one?' "'Very sorry, Deacon,' said I, for he really seemed to be annoyed.' He laughed at his own irritation. "'Excuse me, Markham,' said he. "'The fact is that I have had an awful job over the beast. "'All day I've been painting him in and painting him out "'and trying to imagine what a real live ramping unicorn would look like. "'At last I got him, as I hoped. "'So when you fail to recognise it, it took me on the raw. "'Why, of course it's a unicorn,' said I, "'for he was evidently depressed at my obtuseness.' I can see the horn quite plainly. But I never saw a unicorn except beside the royal arms, and so I never thought of the creature. And these others are griffins and cockatrices and dragons of sorts? Yes. I had no difficulty with them. It was the unicorn which bothered me. However, there's an end of it until tomorrow. He turned the picture round upon the easel, and we all chatted about other subjects. Moyer was late that evening, and when he did arrive he brought with him, rather to our surprise, a small stout Frenchman, whom he introduced as Monsieur Paul le Duc. I say to our surprise, for we held a theory that any intrusion into our spiritual circle deranged the conditions, and introduced an element of suspicion. We knew that we could trust each other, but all our results were vitiated, by the presence of an outsider. However, Moyer soon reconciled us to the innovation. Monsieur Paul Le Duc was a famous student of occultism, a seer, a medium, and a mystic. He was travelling in England with a letter of introduction to Moyer, from the president of the Parisian Brothers of the Rosy Cross. What more natural than that he should bring him to our little séance, or that we should feel honoured by his presence? He was, as I have said, a small, stout man, undistinguished in appearance, with a broad, smooth, clean-shaven face, remarkable only for a pair of large brown, velvety eyes, staring vaguely out in front of him. He was well dressed with the manners of a gentleman, and his curious little turns of English speech set the ladies smiling. Mrs. Deacon had a prejudice against our researches and left the room, upon which we lowered the lights, as was our custom, and drew up our chairs to the square mahogany table which stood in the centre of the studio. The light was subdued, but sufficient to allow us to see each other quite plainly. I remember that I could even observe the curious, podgy little square-topped hands, 
which the Frenchman laid upon the table. "'What a fun!' said he. "'It is many years since I have sat in this fashion, and it is to me amusing. Madame is medium. Does Madame make the trance?' "'Well, hardly that,' said Mrs. Delamere. "'But I am always conscious of extreme sleepiness. It is the first stage.' Then you encourage it, and there comes the trance. When the trance comes, then out jumps your little spirit, and in jumps another little spirit, and so you have direct talking or writing. You leave your machine to be worked by another, eh? But what have uh, unicorns to do with it? Harvey Deacon started in his chair. The Frenchman was moving his head slowly round, and staring into the shadows which draped the walls. What a fun, said he. Always unicorns. Who has been thinking so hard upon a subject so bizarre? This is wonderful, cried Deacon. I've been trying to paint one all day. But how could you know it? You have been thinking of them in this room. Certainly. But thoughts are things, my friend. When you imagine a thing, you make a thing. You did not know it, huh? But I can see your unicorns because it is not only with my eye that I can see. Do you mean to say that I create a thing which has never existed by merely thinking of it? But certainly it is the fact which lies under all other facts. That is why an evil thought is also a danger. They are, I suppose, upon the astral plane, said Moya. Ah, well, these are but words, my friends. They are there... Somewhere, everywhere, I cannot tell myself. I see them. I could touch them. You could not make us see them. It is to materialize them. Hold, it is an experiment. But the power is wanting. Let us see what power we have, and then arrange what we shall do. May I place you as I wish? You evidently know a great deal more about it than we do, said Harvey Deacon. I wish that you would take complete control. It may be that the conditions are not good, but we will try what we can do. Madame will sit where she is, I next, and this gentleman beside me. Mr. Moyer will sit next to Madame, because it is well to have blacks and blondes in turn. So, and now, with your permission, I will turn the lights all out. What is the advantage of the dark? I asked because the force with which we deal is a vibration of ether, and so also is light. We have the wires all for ourselves now, huh? You will not be frightened in the darkness, madame? What a fun is such a séance. At first the darkness appeared to be absolutely pitchy, but in a few minutes our eyes became so far accustomed to it that we could just make out each other's presence, very dimly and vaguely, it is true. I could see nothing else in the room, only the black loom of the motionless figures. We were all taking the matter much more seriously than we had ever done before. You will place your hands in front. It is hopeless that we touch, since we are so few round so large a table. You will compose yourself, madame, and if sleep should come to you, you will not fight against it. And now we sit in silence and we expect. Huh? So we sat in silence and expected, staring out into the blackness in front of us. A clock ticked in the passage. A dog barked intermittently far away. Once or twice a cab rattled past in the street, and the gleam of its lamps through the chink in the curtains was a cheerful break in that gloomy vigil. I felt those physical symptoms with which previous séances had made me familiar. The coldness of the feet, the tingling in the hands, the glow of the palms, the feeling of a cold wind upon the back. Strange little shooting pains came in my forearms, especially as it seemed to me in my left one, which was nearest to our visitor, due no doubt to disturbance of the vascular system, but worthy of some attention all the same. At the same time I was conscious of a strained feeling of expectancy which was almost painful. From the rigid, absolute silence of my companions, I gathered that their nerves were as tense as my own. 
and then suddenly a sound came out of the darkness, a low, sibilant sound, the quick, thin breathing of a woman. Quicker and thinner yet it came, as between clenched teeth, to end in a loud gasp with a dull rustle of cloth. "'What's that? Is it all right?' someone asked in the darkness. "'Yes, all is right.' said the Frenchman. It is Madame. She is in a trance. Now, gentlemen, if you will wait quiet, you will see something, I think, which will interest you much. Still the ticking in the hall, still the breathing deeper and fuller now from the medium, still the occasional flash, more welcome than ever, of the passing lights of the hansoms. What a gap we were bridging, the half-raised veil of the Eternal on one side and the cabs of London on the other, the table was throbbing with a mighty pulse. It swayed steadily, rhythmically, with an easy swooping, scooping motion under our fingers. Sharp little raps and cracks came from its substance, file firing, volley firing, the sounds of a faggot burning briskly on a frosty night. There is much power, said the Frenchman. See it on the table. I had thought it was some delusion of my own, but all could see it now. There was a greenish-yellow phosphorescent light, or I should say a luminous vapour rather than a light, which lay over the surface of the table. It rolled and wreathed and undulated in dim, glimmering folds, turning and swirling like clouds of smoke. I could see the white, square-ended hands of the French medium in this baleful light. What a fun, he cried. It is splendid. Shall we call the alphabet? asked Moyer. But no, for we can do much better, said our visitor. It is but a clumsy thing to tilt the table for every letter of the alphabet, and with such a medium as Madame, we should do better than that. Yes, you will do better, said a voice. Who was that who spoke? Was that you, Markham? No, I did not speak. It was Madame who spoke. But it was not her voice. Is that you, Mrs. Delamere? It is not the medium, but it is a power which uses the organs of the medium, said the strange, deep voice. Where is Mrs. Delamere? It will not hurt her, I trust. The medium is happy in another plane of existence. She has taken my place as I have taken hers. Who are you? It cannot matter to you who I am. I am one who has lived as you are living and who has died as you will die. We heard the creak and grate of a cab pulling up next door. There was an argument about the fare, and the cabman grumbled hoarsely down the street. The green-yellow cloud still swirled faintly over the table, dull elsewhere, but glowing into a dim luminosity in the direction of the medium. It seemed to be piling itself up in front of her. A sense of fear and cold struck into my heart. It seemed to me that lightly and flippantly, we had approached the most real and august of sacraments, that communion with the dead of which the fathers of the church had spoken. "'Don't you think we are going too far? Should we not break up this séance?' I cried. But the others were all earnest to see the end of it. They laughed at my scruples. "'All the powers are made for use,' said Harvey Deacon. "'If we can't do this, we should do this.' Every new departure of knowledge has been called unlawful in its inception. It is right and proper that we should inquire into the nature of death. It is right and proper, said the voice. There, what more could you ask? cried Moyer, who was much excited. Let us have a test. Will you give us a test that you are really there? What test do you demand? Well, now, I have some coins in my pocket. Will you tell me how many? We come back in the hope of teaching and of elevating, and not to guess childish riddles. Ha-ha, Mr. Moyer, you catch it that time, cried the Frenchman. But surely this is very good sense, what the control is saying. It is a religion, not a game, said the cold, hard voice. Exactly, the very view I take of it, cried Moyer. I am sure I am very sorry if I have asked a foolish question. You will not tell me who you are? What does it matter? Have you been a spirit long? Yes. How long? We cannot reckon time as you do. Our conditions are different. Are you happy? Yes. 
You would not wish to come back to life? No, certainly not. Are you busy? We could not be happy if we were not busy. What do you do? I have said that the conditions are entirely different. Can you give us no idea of your work? We labour for our own improvement and for the advancement of others. Do you like coming here tonight? I am glad to come if I can do any good by coming. Then to do good is your object? It is the object of all life on every plane. You see, Markham, that should answer your scruples. It did, for my doubts had passed and only interest remained. Have you pain in your life? I asked. No, pain is a thing of the body. Have you mental pain? Yes, one may always be sad or anxious. Do you meet the friends with whom you have known on earth? Some of them. Why only some of them? Only those who are sympathetic. Do husbands meet wives? Those who have truly loved, and the others? They are nothing to each other. There must be a spiritual connection, of course. Is what we are doing right? If done in the right spirit, what is the wrong spirit? Curiosity and levity. May harm come of that? Very serious harm. What sort of harm? You may call up forces over which you have no control. Evil forces? Undeveloped forces. You say they're dangerous. Dangerous to mind or body. Sometimes to both. There was a pause, and the blackness seemed to grow blacker still, while the yellow-green fog swirled and smoked upon the table. Any question you would like to ask, Moya? said Harvey Deacon. Only this? Do you pray in your world? One should pray in every world. Why? Because it is the acknowledgement of forces outside ourselves. What religion do you hold over there? We differ exactly as you do. You have no certain knowledge? We have only faith. These questions of religion, said the Frenchman, they are of interest to you serious English people, but they are not so much fun. It seems to me that with this power here, we might be able to have some great experience, eh? something of which we could talk. But nothing could be more interesting than this, said Moya. Well, if you think so, that is very well, the Frenchman answered peevishly. For my part, it seems to me that I have heard all this before, and that tonight... I should wish to try some experiment with all this force which is given to us. But if you have other questions, then ask them, and when you are finished, we can try something more. But the spell was broken. We asked and asked, but the medium sat silent in her chair. Only her deep, regular breathing showed that she was there. The mist still swirled upon the table. You have disturbed the harmony. She will not answer. But we have learned already all that she can tell, huh? For my part, I wish to see something that I have never seen before. What then? You will let me try? What would you do? I have said to you that thoughts are things. Now I wish to prove it to you, and to show you that which is only a thought. Yes, yes, I can do it, and you will see. Now I ask you only to sit still and say nothing, and keep ever your hands quiet upon the table. The room was blacker and more silent than ever. The same feeling of apprehension which had lain heavily upon me at the beginning of the séance was back at my heart once more. The roots of my hair were tingling. "'It is working! It is working!' cried the Frenchman, and there was a crack in his voice as he spoke which told me that he also was strung to his tightest. The luminous fog drifted slowly off the table and wavered and flickered across the room. There, in the farthest and darkest corner, it gathered and glowed, hardening down into a shining core, a strange shifty, luminous and yet non-illuminating patch of radiance, bright itself, but throwing no rays into the darkness. It had changed from a greenish-yellow to a dusky, sullen red. Then round this centre there coiled a dark, smoky substance, thickening, hardening, growing denser and blacker, and then the light went out, smothered in that which had grown round it. It was gone. Hush, there's something in the room. 
We heard it in the corner where the light had been, something which breathed deeply and fidgeted in the darkness. What is it? Le Duc, what have you done? It is all right. No arm will come. The Frenchman's voice was treble with agitation. Good heavens, Moyer, there's a large animal in the room. Here it is, close by my chair. Go away. Go away. It was Harvey Deacon's voice, and then came the sound of a blow upon some hard object, and then... And then, how can I tell you what happened then? Some huge thing hurtled against us in the darkness, rearing, stamping, smashing, springing, snorting. The table was splintered. We were scattered in every direction. It clattered and scrambled amongst us, rushing with horrible energy from one corner of the room to another. We were all screaming with fear, grovelling upon our hands and knees to get away from it. Something trod upon my left hand, and I felt the bone splinter under the weight. "'A light! A light!' someone yelled. "'Moya, you have matches! Matches! No, I have none! Deacon, where are the matches? For God's sake, the matches! I can't find them! Here, you Frenchman, stop it!' It is beyond me. Oh, mon Dieu, I cannot stop it. The door! Where is the door? My hand, by good luck, lit upon the handle as I groped about in the darkness. The hard-breathing, snorting, rushing creature tore past me and butted with a fearful crash against the oaken partition. The instant that it had passed, I turned the handle, and next moment we were all outside, and the door shut behind us. From within came a horrible crashing and rending and stamping. What is it? In heaven's name, what is it? A horse. I saw it when the door opened. But Mrs. Delamere, we must fetch her out. Come on, Markham. The longer we wait, the less we shall like it. He flung open the door and we rushed in. She was there on the ground amidst the splinters of her chair. We seized her and grabbed her swiftly out, and as we gained the door I looked over my shoulder into the darkness. There were two strange eyes glowing at us, a rattle of hoofs, and I had just time to slam the door when there came a crash upon it which split it from top to bottom. "'Us coming through! Us coming! "'Run! Run for your lives!' cried the Frenchman. Another crash, and something shot through the riven door— it was a long, white spike, gleaming in the lamplight. For a moment it shone before us, and then with a snap it disappeared again. Quick, quick, this way, Harvey Deacon shouted. Carry her in, here, quick. We had taken refuge in the dining room and shut the heavy oak door. We laid the senseless woman upon the sofa, and as we did so, Moya, the hard man of business, dropped and fainted across the hearth rug. Harvey Deacon, as white as a corpse, jerking and twitching like an epileptic. With a crash we heard the studio door fly to pieces, and the snorting and stamping were in the passage, up and down, up and down, shaking the house with their fury. The Frenchman had sunk his face on his hands and sobbed like a frightened child. What shall we do? I shook him roughly by the shoulder. Is a gun any use? No, no, the power will pass. Then it will end. You might have killed us all, you unspeakable fool, with your infernal experiments. I did not know. How could I tell that it would be frightened? It is mad with terror. It was his fault. He struck it. Harvey Deacon sprang up. Good heavens, he cried. A terrible scream had sounded through the house. That's my wife. Here, I'm going out. Have as the evil one himself. I am going out. He had thrown open the door and rushed out into the passage. At the end of it, at the foot of the stairs, Mrs. Deacon was lying senseless, struck down by the sight which she had seen. But there was nothing else. With eyes of horror we looked about us, but all was perfectly quiet and still. I approached the black square of the studio door, expecting with every slow step that some atrocious shape would hurl itself out of it. But nothing came, and all was silent inside the room. Peeping and peering, our hearts in our mouths, we came to the very threshold and stared into the darkness. There was still no sound, but in one direction there was also no darkness. A luminous, glowing cloud 
with an incandescent centre, hovered in the corner of the room. Slowly it dimmed and faded, growing thinner and fainter, until at last the same dense, velvety blackness filled the whole studio, and with the last flickering gleam of that baleful light, the Frenchman broke into a shout of joy. "'What a fun!' he cried. "'No one is hurt, and only the door broken and the ladies frightened. But, my friends, we have done what has never been done before. And as far as I can help,' said Harvey Deacon, "'that will certainly never be done again.' And that was what befell. On the 14th of April last, at number 17, Baddeley Gardens, I began by saying that it would seem too grotesque to dogmatise as to what it was which actually did occur. But I give my impressions, our impressions, since they are corroborated by Harvey Deacon and John Moyer, for what they are worth. You may, if it pleases you, imagine that we were the victims of an elaborate and extraordinary hoax or you may think, with us, that we underwent a very real and a very terrible experience. Or perhaps you may know more than we do of such occult matters and can inform us of some similar occurrence. In this latter case, a letter to William Markham, 146M, Albany, would help to throw a light upon that which is very dark to us. That is the end of Playing with Fire by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Read by Greg Wagland for Magpie Audio 2018.